I'm going to open with Psalm 138, one of my favorite psalms. <laughs> I've got a lot of favorite psalms. <laughs> I, know I memorized about 35 psalms, so I've got a lot of favorites. But, um, there is so much revelation in Psalm 138, it's, it's amazing. But Of course, the Psalm of David. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praises unto thee. I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your mercy and for your truth. For you have magnified your word or your saying above all your name. In the day when I cried, you answered me and strengthened me with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knows afar off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me, O Lord. Thou wilt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. Thou shalt perfect that which concerneth me. Your mercy endures forever. Forsake not the work of thine own hands. Forsake not the work of thy hands, Lord. Father, that you would show us your ways, that you would teach us your paths, that we may walk in them, Lord, that we may know you. Father, that it would be said of us that we had a face-to-face -face relationship with you. that we may know even as we are known. Holy Spirit, I thank you for revealing to us, removing the veils. Spirit of truth for teaching us. We just surrender to you not tonight, Lord. Holy Spirit, that you would lead us. And you would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. The eyes of our hearts being enlightened that we would know what is the hope of your calling and what the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints and what the exceeding greatness of your power to usward who believe according to the working of your mighty power which you wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead and set him at your own right hand far above all principality, power, dominion, and might and every name that is named Father, that you would grant us, according to the riches of your glory, to be strengthened with might by your Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length, and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that we might be filled with all the fullness of you. Now unto you who are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think.
according to the power that worketh in us. Unto you be glory in the church throughout all ages. Amen. Yeah, I'm going to talk about grace for just a few minutes. You know, according to the power that worketh in us, that's grace. But grace has been given this really narrow definition by many <clears throat> to simply say it's the favor of God. <laughs> there are certainly um, places where where that is the the most accurate um, usage, but the majority of of when Father's talking about grace, he's talking about his will, and it's the will of his good pleasure towards us. So his graciousness is, is the will of his good pleasure towards us. And that grace in our lives is the power of his will, of his will in our lives. It's the power of his will in our lives. According to the power that worketh in us, that's his will performing it, not our will. So... Who does he give grace to? The humble. He resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. humble. See, we have to come low and not live out of our will so that his will, his grace can be, can empower us. And so that's why we have to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Because the proud live after their own will. The proud live after their own desires. And see here, the great danger, it's more than a great danger, but of, of this hyper grace, this greasy grace thing, that it's, it's just the favor of God. And no. And in that message, where do you hear the power of the cross? Where do you hear a crucified life? Because, see, without the crucified life, the power of his will in us, it's ineffectual. Because we have to be surrendered in order for his will to operate in our lives, for his grace to work in our lives. When was, what did he say to Paul in, in his weakness? My grace is sufficient. It's, it's in the weakness. Because see, there's the power of his will then can work. But as long as we're living out of our own self-will, which is rebellion, as long as we're living out of our desires, his grace is limited in what it can do in our lives. And so we can talk about grace all we want, if we're not willing to live a surrendered life in obedience to his word, because what is his word? It is, it is his will. It's his will. And the power of his will allows us to be able to fill that word. I want to show you a scripture just to make this really clear to you, and it's amazing how far the lack of revelation on this, but when, I, when the Lord begins to reveal something to me, I don't, I don't go to the Strong's, I don't to try and define a word. I go to the scriptures and see the usage and, and allow time for the Lord to teach me what does this word mean. And so, turn to Luke chapter 6.
what really forced me to really seek after an understanding of grace when I was being attacked by a, a hyper grace person. <laughs> and it was good because it made me it made me go deeper. I said, okay, Lord, I really haven't sought you on this, you know. And it, it made me he would attack mercy. It's like like mercy's this awful thing. I'm like, what? Weekly, he was attacking me because I talk about mercy. And I'm just like, there is no grace without mercy. So anyways, but it's a good thing because it made me, it made me go deeper and seek the Lord on this. So Luke chapter 6, which is um, Christ is, uh, Jesus is, is kind of reiterating some of the things that he spoke um, in the Beatitudes, you know, Matthew chapter 5, the, from, the, from the Mount, from Zion, actually, is where he delivered that. But, um, but this is a, dish, a different occasion, and he says it slightly differently. Um, and here in Luke chapter 6, you know, you know, he's talking about love. Let's just let's just begin, verse twenty-seven. But I say unto you, which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, <clears throat> bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the cheek, offer him also the other. Okay, how many of you are ready to do that? <laughs> you know, think about that. This is what Jesus is saying. Give him the other. Can't tell you how many pastors say, no, you punch, you know, defend yourself, punch him. <laughs> you know? But what was Jesus, when he was smitten on the one cheek and he turned the other thing, what was he doing? He was like taking it upon himself. He was remitting sins. He was taking the sin upon himself. And this is the love. This is God's love. And unto him that smiteth thee on the cheek, offer him also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. So think about that. You get sued and somebody takes something. You say, well, just you can have my car too. You know? <laughs> but most of us, we go, oh, here you go. Take this too. You know? <laughs> That's not quite the spirit in the way he wants us to do it, you know? <clears throat> and as you would that men should do to you, do you also to them likewise. Hey, Dave. Hi. Oh, I get the throne tonight. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. In verse 32, Luke chapter 6 says, For if you love them which love you, what thank have you? That's pretty strange, isn't it? But we're going we're gonna to talk about this. For if you love them which love you, what thank have you? Now, somebody have a different translation. What does yours say? Credit. What credit have you? For sinners also love those that love them. For if you love them which love you, what thank or what credit have you? You know what that word for thank is? It's charis. It's grace. It's grace. Luke chapter 6, verse 32. <laughs> for if you love them which love you, what charis, what grace have you? For sinners also love those that love them. See, what is Jesus saying? If all you're doing is loving those that love you, you don't need grace. 
See, grace is the power of the Father's will to love as He loves. It's the power of His will in your life to walk in the truth, to love as He loved. You don't need grace to love those that love you. (laughs) Even sinners do the same. And Christians think, oh, I'm so nice, I love them. But if somebody's nasty towards them, they're like, oh, I'm bitterness and... Where's grace functioning there? See, we need grace, the power of his will in our life, to love as he loved. But it was amazing to me as, as today as I, I went to BibleHub.com and I wanted to see how this was translated. And in the 25 translations... Only two translated it grace. It's amazing to me. The Young's Literal, and I think it was the Jubilee 2000. Two out of 25 got it right. But this shows you the lack of revelation of what grace really is. See, what is grace? By his grace, he drew us to himself. It was his own will. He begat us by his will. That's grace. We didn't come to him by our own will. We didn't come to him by our own will. He drew us. No man can come unto me unless the Father draws him. Of his own will, of his own will begat he us by the word of truth. Had nothing to do with our will. What happened there... In that moment, there was a surrendering of our will to his will. That's what happened. Because the goodness of God led us to repentance, a turning to him and receiving the empowering of his will, of his love. But do we continue to live out of that place? So for if you love them which love you, what grace have you? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what grace have you? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what grace have you? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind, as the Greek word Christos, he is good unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. So grace is not so much about favor. It's his graciousness is the good is the will of his good pleasure towards us. But the grace working in our lives is the power of his will in our lives. What did Jesus say? Not my will, but your will be done. That's grace. Why was it Mary that was called upon to bear Jesus? Because she was brought to a low place. And she said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to your word, according to your will. So in our pride, we are living out of our own will, out of our own desires. But the crucified life is crucifying the desires 
crucifying the self-will and totally living out of the will of the Father, which is grace. That is grace. It's not the favor to do what we want and our sins covered. Amen. That is a lie from to send you to hell is what it is. A lie from the pit. And so anyway, I felt just to, to open with that because there's such a perversion of what grace is. It's the power of his will in our lives. But it does not, it's, it's ineffectual as long as in our pride we're trying to do everything out of our own strength, right? How There's this, you know, and... What's the centrality of Christ's message? The cross. Die to the self so that grace, so the power of the Father's will can work in your life. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight, I desire to do thy will, O my God. For your law is in my heart. See, the secret place of the Father, it says in Proverbs 16.6, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. Iniquity is that self-will. It's it's our selfish desires, our self-will, which which is idolatry. It's serving our own belly. And Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 3, whose God is their belly, their desires, who mind earthly things. And he was talking about people that were in the church. What is that? It's carnal Christians. What do carnal Christians, they're still walking after the flesh, they're still walking after their own desires, after their own will, And the grace of God is not empowered there. The grace of God functions in a life that is surrendered, totally surrendered. Of course, Christ was our example on that. It's pretty clear. And Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings and those things that bring me low. (laughs) So back to uh, Psalm 138, which I opened with. You know, David says, I will praise you with my whole heart before the gods. Will I sing praises unto thee? I will worship towards your holy temple. He's not speaking about a temple on earth. There was no temple on earth yet. There was no physical temple until David. The best, there was a tent. But that's not what he was talking about. He was talking about a heavenly place. The heavenly courts. The holy of holies. I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your mercy and for your truth. What name is that? It's Exodus 34, 6, when Moses said, show me your glory, the Father says, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. And what did he say? Lord, Lord God, or Yahweh, Yahweh El, compassionate, gracious, long-suffering, abundant, and mercy and truth. Okay? This is when he says, show me your glory. So, David's saying, I will praise your name for your mercy and your truth. This is this name that has mercy and truth in it. Okay? For you have magnified your word above all your name. It's not the Hebrew Debar. It's the Hebrew Imra. I will, for you have magnified your saying above all your name. Now, the saying has his words in it, but it's, it's talking about the saying of 
Yahweh, Yahweh El, compassionate, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in mercy and truth. He's magnified this saying above all his name, the saying of his goodness. And in it is the secret place. In it is the tabernacle of David. I used to quote this all the time, you know, because I'm a scripture guy. Magnified his word above all his name. But I didn't have the revelation. No, it's this saying he's magnified above all his name. He is compassionate. I am. What does Yahweh, what does Yahweh mean? What's the, what's the tetragrammation? It means I am. I am, I am God, compassionate, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in mercy and truth. Compassionate, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in mercy and truth. You have magnified your saying above all your name. In the day when I cried, you answered me and strengthened me with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words. Once again, this is Imrah, the sayings of your mouth. They shall sing, they, yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, or they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. The Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, yet the proud he knows afar off. See, it's by mercy and truth that we are brought low, as we humble ourselves under his mighty hand of mercy. This is dealing with pride. So that his grace can flow the power of his will. This is the secret place, the hidden place in Christ, to where we are conformed to his image. Where the Father can form us with his hands into the image of Christ. Of a meek and lowly. That's a life that the grace, the Father's will, is done in. That lives in the Father's desire. Yea, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. Well, what are his ways? You know, Moses said, show me your way that I may know you. David said, show me your ways. Psalm 25, verse 4, show me your ways, teach me your paths. And both of them had face-to-face relationship with the Father. We cannot have a face-to-face relationship unless we know his ways. And we know his paths. We can. And I began praying this a while ago. Lord, show me your ways. You know, he's revealed to me his paths. And so there were David prays in in Psalm 25, verse 4, show me your ways, teach me your paths. Right there in verse 10 he says, all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. It's in this secret place. That's where I'm being brought down and I'm coming into agreement with the truth. Mercy and truth. I'm humbling myself under his mighty hand through repentance, coming out of my prideful self and coming into agreement with his truth, which is his will. So in humbling myself under his hand, there his grace can come in, the power of his will, to allow me to fulfill the truth. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. What is the iniquity? As it says in Isaiah chapter 28, that Lucifer was perfect in all his ways until 
iniquity was found in him. And what is that iniquity? It says Isaiah, Isaiah chapter um, 14, verse 13, I think. I will ascend into the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in the mount of the congregation and the sides of the north. I will sit as judge. I will ascend above the clouds. I will be like the most high. The self will. And don't you think that's not just him? (laughs) How many times have we sat as judge? And when we're living out of our own desires, out of our own self-will, we're trying to be like him. We're we're, we're ruling. I, I I can rule my life. I'm independent. It's the sin of pride, which is the great transgression of rebellion. As David said in Psalm 19, keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. That word presumptuous is pride. Prideful sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and shall be innocent from the great transgression, the rebellion. David was ever pursuing mercy and truth. That's the tabernacle of David. To abide in the Father's hands before his face. See, there's the face-to-face relationship. David found that face-to-face relationship with the Father. Moses had that face-to-face relationship with the Father. Moses said, I knew him face-to-face. And when I spoke to him, he would see the similitude of me. I don't know, do you want that? Well, they both asked to know his ways and his paths. Israel did not know his ways. As it says in Psalm chapter, uh, Psalm 103, um, verse 7, it says, The Lord made known unto Moses his ways, his acts unto Israel. See, what was Israel seeking him for? Were they seeking a face-to-face relationship? No. It's all about self, right? Give me something. Give me something. What? An evil generation seeketh after a sign. They just want some, you know, give us something. But they're not seeking a face-to-face relationship. Are you seeking him to know him, or are you seeking him to get something? (laughs) A better life, uh, a nicer car, a nicer house, the prosperity gospel, or to know him. This is where the judgment's going to come down on the house of God is over this issue. Over this nation. Over this prosperity gospel. What we can get from his hands rather than coming into the relationship. I was amazed this week I was just doing a little research and Who are some of the prosperity gospel guys? What's the biggest one out there? The Kenneth Copeland. You know what he's worth? $760 million. Serving the belly. Our own will. A 
So, the ways of the Lord, the three principal ways, the way of righteousness, the way of holiness, and the way of peace. That is the good way. It's all three of them. It's the good way. Just as there is one baptism, but there are three. There's the baptism of repentance, the water baptism. There's the baptism of the spirit of truth. And there is a baptism of fire. But there is only one baptism, it says in Ephesians chapter 4. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Because they're all three working. Just as God is three in one. So it is with his ways. There are three, but there is only one. And so it's not a linear thinking, well, I do this, this, and this. It's, it's they're all working together. And so last week I talked... about the way of righteousness as he began to reveal this. I know I know nothing as I ought to know on these things, but actually I didn't post Saturday because I didn't feel like I communicated very well, but Tuesday night I I released more. Um, But really the way of righteousness begins with the turning, the repentance. John, as Jesus said, that John came in the way of righteousness. And it was all about repentance, about turning. Humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God so you receive his mercy so that his grace can come into your life. Because without the humbling, (laughs) what does John mean? Yahweh is gracious. But how does that grace come? It comes through the mercy, humbling ourselves under his mighty hand of mercy. And without doing that, we don't, we're not living in grace. We can talk about it all we want, but if we're not pursuing the surrendered life, And coming out of this world, all our desires, everything coming to him. It's not, that power is not working in our lives. Because it works through the surrendered life. Where is the power? It's in the cross. The power is in the cross. The surrendered life. There is the resurrection life. The power of his will. And so that's the essence of the way of righteousness. It's more than that because as we turn, then we begin to walk. As we turn and repent, we're also walking in the way of righteousness. We're beginning to step into the truth, aren't we? So there is mercy and truth. We're repenting, coming under his hand, and then we're empowered to walk in the truth. And there it meets holiness. And what is holiness? It's coming out of everything that defiles. Defilement is the opposite of holiness. It's coming out of everything that defiles. The desires of this world that defile us. (coughs) When James, when lust or desire has conceived, it brings forth Sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. It's coming out of our own desires. How do, we, how do we crucify the old man? It's coming out of all our desires, all of our self-will. That's the simplicity of it. If you're, if you're unwilling to come out and humble yourself in repentance... will never, can't be transformed into the image of Christ. And so the way of holiness, or the highway of holiness, as Isaiah 35 puts it, 
There shall be a highway there away, and it shall be call, called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for way-faring men. Though fools shall not err therein, no lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereupon, shall not be found there. But the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain, they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. There shall be a highway there to return back to Zion, but it's totally coming out of the world. Will you shut the TV off and never return to it? Are we lovers of the truth? Are we truly lovers of the truth? Or are our desires, are we still under our own earthly desires? 1 John chapter 2, 15, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the desires of the flesh, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the desires pass away. The world passes away and the desires thereof. But he that does the will of God abides forever. See, in our desires, in our fleshly desires, we fulfill the will of the flesh and of the mind. Are we truly living in his desire? This is what Ephesians chapter 2 teaches us. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. I know you guys know this really well, so I'll just ramble it off. And you who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the children of disobedience, among whom you also had your conduct in times past in the lust or the desires of your flesh, fulfilling the will of the flesh and of the mind. In the desires of your flesh, fulfilling the will of the flesh and of the mind. See, the desires fulfill the will of the flesh. Just as we have to live in the desire of God to fulfill the will of God. I've had people who say, how do I die? How do I die to myself? Uh, it's like, come out, shut the TV off, <laughs> quit eating with demons, <laughs> quit drinking of demons, quit fellowshipping with demons, quit eating of the desires of the world. how few people will walk the highway of holiness and truly come out. I've been preaching this message for a long time and I've seen very few people that are willing to truly do that. All a little bit's okay. Who among us shall dwell with devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly that despises the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands of holy and bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of evil, that shutteth his eyes from seeing of blood. Well, you know, I think that's figurative. I mean, what's, what's, what's in question there? You know? What's in question there? Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. Everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from 
all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace shall sanctify you, shall set you apart, holy, completely. And your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. We have a part, don't we? Will we come out from our desires? Or do we allow them to be inflamed? I mean, I shut the TV off, I don't know, five years, maybe it's been six years ago now. Something the Lord had dealt with me probably nine, ten years ago when I had done it then, and then people were like, oh, you're just, you know, you're like over the top. And I go, oh, maybe I am, you know. <laughs> and then the Lord dealt with me again. It's like, no, that's it, period. I've never turned back. And, you know, but then I found myself, I mean, I was into sports. I was into all that entertainment. I, I loved that. It would draw my, well, you could feel it, draw my desires. That's not good. That's idolatry. Our eye is to be single on him. And so I had to cut all that, but I found myself, oh, I'd look on my phone and what was the score? And I just get sucked in a little more, a little more, a little more. Oh, I can look what that article says. Oh, I look at the news, and then the, in the news, there's all these little hooks, you know, sexual hooks, whatever there is. Desires of the world. It's the world. It's the world, and we're eating of the world. I had to totally cut off all that. I won't even, I won't even look at the news on my phone. Because, see, in separating myself, I could feel, the more you separate, the more you can feel that draw. Mm -hmm. You can feel the defilement. Mm -hmm. But if you're so drawn into it, and it's just your everyday life, you go, well, they do it, you know? Everybody does it, right? My pastor does it, my... Will we totally come out? This is the way of holiness. It's coming out of our desires and living out of his desire. So the way of holiness is coming out of our desire. It's being lovers of the truth and walking in the truth, isn't it? See, do you love the truth? What's so difficult about abstain from all appearance of evil? Do you believe that? Are you a lover of the truth? I know this is a little bit strong, but you know what? The blood's on me if I don't say it, you know? John didn't just preach righteousness. He, he taught the way of holiness as well. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, the way of righteousness. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God, a highway of holiness. And every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. There's the pride coming down. The crooked shall be made straight. That's, that's the iniquity, the, the bent nature. If we'll just repent and turn and come out, then his grace, his fire can work in our lives. But if we won't walk in the eternal paths of mercy and truth, there is no fire there. There is no refining. If we won't come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. What's tough about that? Why is it you look at most Christians, they don't look any different. Their lives don't look at, they watch the same movies. They're... Where's, where's the holiness? And trust me, the enemy comes against this because he knows the power of holiness. Every holiness movement he has destroyed in the past. 
and brought division and all these things because he knows the power of holiness. And this message always comes under fire. Oh, you're condemning me. Well, you're already condemned if you reject the truth. <laughs> you know, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus, but what is that? It's, it's humbling yourself under his hand of mercy to receive the empowerment of his will, which allows you to do the truth. There's no condemnation there. Because you're empowered to do it. No, we can't do it of our own strength. We cannot do it of our own will. See, that's the law that, that, that Paul was talking about. You can't do it in your own strength. You have to surrender and die to self, and then the power to fulfill it is there. He was not saying, don't keep the Ten Commandments. If he was saying that, he wouldn't have said that all fornicators and adulterers are going... If that was done away, how could he even say that? How could he say that? Because that was the law. Oh, no, there's no law. Oh, okay, well then, where did Paul get that from? Where did that come from? See, this whole, this whole grace thing is just whacked out. Paul was principally addressing, he was addressing the work of the flesh and trying to do it after our own strength and our own pride, which is what the religious were doing, weren't they? We don't need to humble ourselves. We don't need to repent. You know, we just circumcise. You know, you get circumcised too. You know, see, I'm circumcised. I'm fulfilling it. No, no, it's, we're to be circumcised in heart now. You know, Israel was circumcised in the flesh because they brought forth the promised seed after the flesh. We are bringing forth Christ after the Spirit, so we are to be circumcised in our hearts. They were as well, but we don't have to worry about the, the flesh thing anymore. <laughs> The desires, are you willing? Or is, is your God your belly? Whose God is their belly? Who mind earthly things? Paul said, walk after me and those that have walked as an example of the crucified life. For many, many I tell you, walk. after the desire of their own belly, whose God is their belly, who mind earthly things. I ask you, who, who do you think the Lord would be angry with? Homosexuals and everything else in the world that haven't heard the truth or Christians that aren't walking according to the truth. That's where his wrath is kindled right now. And why is judgment going to begin at the house of God? It's because we're walking just like Pharisees and Sadducees, walking after the flesh, still walking after the desires and unwilling to repent and walk a life of holiness. And saying it's okay. That's why I had to come out of the church. It's because of the compromise that was constantly there. I mean, I'm in the church. I'm just saying, organized so much of what's out there, that it's okay. And I'm up there preaching this message, and the next thing, it's preach this. And I'm like... And they're saying it's okay, and I'm saying it's not, and I've become their enemy. <laughs> Compromise, okay. No, it's not. <laughs> A little's okay. Just say this prayer and you'll get to heaven. No, that's, that was never the intent, is to be conformed to the image of Christ. Amen. That's the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Conformed to the image of Christ. 
and living from the throne, which is mercy and truth. And mercy, the throne is established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David. See, the tabernacle of David is the Father's hands. That's where David dwelt. That's the tabernacle of David. And what's the key to enter is mercy and truth. Because what? In mercy, to come into that house, we must first humble ourselves under his mighty hand. As Jeremiah chapter 6, <clears throat> 16, stand ye in the ways, talking about the ways of man, and see and ask for the ancient or the eternal paths, wherein is the good way, and walk therein, and you shall find rest. For your souls. What's that mean? You're empowered by him. But they said, we will not walk therein. And what are those eternal paths? They're mercy and truth. They're eternal paths. They're the Father's hands. They're, the, they're eternal because they're the paths to abide before him. Are we lovers of the truth? Are we lovers of its mercy and coming under his hand? And this is where our nation is. An evil generation seeketh after a sign. We're seeking what comes from his hands instead of abiding there. So many are. And so what eventually comes, he gives you over to the desires. Because they did not like Romans chapter 1. Because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, their awareness, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. To do those things which are unseemly. And so if you go to a conference because you want to see healings, you want to see all these things, but you're not a lover of the truth, you want to still walk in your sin, but you're saying, I want God. What God do you really want? It's self is what you want. I can tell you there's deceiving spirits being poured out in those places. There is spirits of delusion being poured out in that. This is judgment beginning at the house of God as he gives, he begins, this is the falling away in which, okay, I'll give, you know, you reject my goodness and, and my way and haven't sought my ways, You're given over to blindness and delusion. And there is a false presence. Oh, I want the presence, but I don't want a sanctified life. What is that? You know what Lucifer is called in the occult, don't you? The presence. The presence. He can counterfeit the presence. Yes. Yes. That's why people say that one. But even if, see, if we're just going after a feeling, I'm not going after a feeling, I'm going after a knowing, yeah. a face to face knowing. Yes, I realize there is presence there, but if we're living by our feelings, no. No. oh, I feel him on me now, so I know he's. I, I heard that. This, this is a guy from Bethel. And he was preaching a message and saying, it's impossible to keep the Ten Commandments. 
And he was talking about, oh, I feel the presence on me. So the Lord's saying, well done, son. He's, he's pleased with me and what I'm saying. See, you know, you don't think the enemy can bring that stuff? I've heard testimonies of people that have come out of the occult and they were moving way up high and they were brought before Lucifer and they, could, they thought it was Christ. Everything in their body was being drawn and they were just feeling love and everything in their body was being drawn that this was the Christ. If we're not lovers of the truth, we're, we're set up to go down this delusion. <laughs> And if we're not coming out from the desires of the world, why do we feel we need to know the news? Because we can't hear the voice of God? Think about it. Think about it. Why do we feel that the global elite need to tell us what's going on? Where was the news 2,000 years ago? You know, it was like, you know, took like a month to come across. The... Why do we have to, you know what I mean? The need to know, to need to know the world but not know our Lord? Oh, I need to see what's going on right now. Because, you know, something might happen and then that tells me that, you know, it's right around the corner. You know, it's this need to know and it plays into the whole false prophet thing too, this need to know. The false prophets, that's, that's a nice, they love that. I'll give you whatever you want to know. The need to know because people can't hear the voice of God because they're not walking in his ways, in his paths. Well, there's no discernment in that place. Yeah. Yeah. Because the discernment is found when we humble ourselves. I know it's you know it's a little stronger than I normally, but it's just uh, the Lord's just really been hitting me with how far down this path we are. And where his bride is right now. <clears throat> See the sons that come forth. The man child of Revelation chapter 12 that's birthed out of the woman. The woman is the church. It's the daughter of Zion. Revelation chapter 12. Woman clothed with the sun, crowned with 12 stars, birthing the man child. Those are forerunners that come to maturity first in Christ. And the woman's going to be led into the wilderness. But, but see, the the dragon's there ready to devour, and he's going to persecute the woman, the church. That's going to be part of the fire to bring, to turn her totally to him. When the whole grid comes down, and, and, and he pulls the plug on those desires, and that's going to be in his goodness. That he does that to turn his people to repentance. And so don't be so sure it's of the devil when that happens. When he brings the matrix down. <laughs> The good way, righteousness, holiness, and the way of peace. All of those ways we're walking in mercy and truth. 
Those are the eternal paths. And we're being sanctified through his blood, but we're also sanctified by the truth. And so in our sanctification, sanctification it's, it's that continual humbling, continual coming out, continual coming out to where we may be one. How can, be, how can we be one if we're in the world? I am not of the world. And so they are not of the world because I've given them your word. And so sanctif- you know, sanctify them by your truth. Thy word is truth. And so it's not coming, just coming out of our desires. It's not just one dimensional. But what's coming out of our mouths? <laughs> there's a whole other aspect of the sanctification, right? The sanctification of our tongue. That we don't come into agreement with what the enemy is saying, but we come into agreement with the truth. And we're, we become slow to speak. Mm-hmm. I certainly haven't gotten that one under total control yet. <laughs> So there's the highway of holiness. So Isaiah 35, I think I'm going to close this up, but I'm going to recite Isaiah 35, which is one of my favorites. It's talking about the sons. It's talking about the man-child coming forth in maturity. who will receive a glorified body. And so listen, as as it's, see it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 19, that the earnest expectation of creation is waiting for the manifestation, the unveiling of the sons, the mature sons, those who look just like Christ. Not just look like, but to become <laughs> one, one, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this is what Isaiah 35 is talking about. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, for the sons. Wilderness and solitary place shall be glad for them. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy in singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Remember Paul says that in in, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, is it? Lift up the hands which hang low, and make straight paths for your feet. That's what he's talking about, the way of holiness. Strengthen ye the weak hands to confirm the feeble knees, saying to them of a fearful heart, Be strong and fear not. Behold, your God shall come with a vengeance, even God a recompense. He shall come and save you. This is the son saying this to the bride, to the church in the wilderness. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say unto them of fearful heart, be strong and fear not. Behold, your God shall come with a vengeance, even God a recompense. He shall come and save you. This is not talking about the first act of salvation. I'm talking about a greater deliverance. And the blind eyes should be opened and the deaf ears and stopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in the wilderness water shall break forth and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water. And the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds 
and rushes. There shall be a highway there, a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for way-faring men, the good way. Though fools shall not err therein, no lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereupon. It shall not be found there. But the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. And sorrow and sighing shall flee away. As I was saying that, I was reminded there of of Hebrews, I think that's Hebrews chapter 12, where Paul's talking about that. He's talking about pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness bitterness springing up trouble you and defile you. See, there's coming out, part of that coming out of defilement is dealing with forgiveness and things in our heart, isn't it? There's a sanctification is dealing with that kind of stuff in our heart. Pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And see, there's holiness meeting with the way of peace. <laughs> see, these all three, they just, they all come together. It's, it's, it's the good way. Come unto me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you to walk with him. Walk side by side with him on the eternal paths of mercy and truth. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Remember what Jeremiah 6, 16, 7, 16, 16 the eternal paths, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, Christos. My yoke is good. See, it's the good way. We're yoked to the good way, walking with him down the paths of mercy and truth. For my yoke is good, and my burden is light. And he's, what's yoked to the oxen? A plow. That's the symbol of the kingdom. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Which that steps into the way of peace. (laughs) I create the fruit of lips, a peace, peace to them who are far off and to them who are near, and I will heal them. So Father, I thank you for continuing to open up to us your ways, that we may know you, Lord. And like Paul, that we may count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, that we would suffer the loss of all things and count them as dung, that we may win you and be found in Christ, not having our own righteousness, which is the law, but the righteousness which is by faith in Christ. That we may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, we might attain unto the resurrection of life.
Father, I thank you for the power of your will in our lives, Lord. I thank you for breaking strongholds of desire and <coughs> that those things would be severed and cut off and there would be a turning, there would be a repentance, Lord, that your goodness would lead us to repentance, to turn, to turn, to turn from every desire, every desire of the flesh. Lust of the eyes, desire of the eyes, desire of the flesh, and the pride of life, which are not of you, Father. Lord, that we would walk in your desire and your goodness. That we would truly find rest for our souls. Show us your ways, Father. Teach us your paths. For our heart is deceitful above measure. Lord, that we would be counted worthy stand before you. To hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That we'd be counted worthy to be called your friends. John said, he who says he knows him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. He who says he knows him. See, this is the knowing of his ways. Intimately knowing him. You don't know him if you don't, if you don't keep his commandments. And this is John talking again. In the first epistle, John. John means grace. Oh, I thought grace was... Uh, no. <laughs> it's empowered by his will to keep the truth. Amen. Father, thank you for your spirit, for shifting mindsets, for exposing lies. Lord, we turn from all the desires of this world and set our desire wholly on you. Our eye would be single, that our whole body would be full of light. Because when it's on the desires of the world, our eye is evil. And it's being filled with darkness. So Lord, as you said, when you see this day coming, look up and lift up your heads a single eye upon you for the day of your redemption draws nigh. Lord, that we may grasp the urgency of the hour. And not be a people of idolatry. That when you come there would no be there would be no idols in our hearts. that you would not be provoked to jealousy.